లక్ష్మీనాథ సమారంభాం నాదయామున మధ్యమాం అస్మదాచార్యపర్యంతాం వందే గురు పరంపరాం యోనిత్యమచ్యుత పదాంబుజ యుక్మరుక్మ వ్యామోహద స్థతితరాణి తృణాయమేనే అస్మద్గురోర్ భగవతోస్య దయేక సింధోహో రామానుజస్య చరణౌ శరణం ప్రపథ్యే కురువణ్ణేవేహ కర్మాణి జీవిషే శతం సమాహ ఏం త్వయి నాణ్యతోస్తి న కర్మ లిప్యతే నరాహ ద ఈశావాస్య ఉపనిషత్ డిక్లేర్స్ కురువణ్ణేవేహ కర్మాణి జిజీవిషేత్ శతం సమాహ ఏం త్వయి నాణ్యతోస్తి న కర్మ లిప్యతే నరాహ డూ యువర్ డ్యూటీ దట్ ఇస్ రిగార్డ్ ఎవ్రీ యాక్షన్ as work which promises well being of all perform actions which are selfless and contributory in nature entertaining no attachment to the results do your duty functioning as an instrument of god and doing such a duty live 100 long years a glorious life there is no other path the upanishad says which prevents accumulation of karma na karma lipyate naraha evam tvayi evam tvayi nanyatosti na karma lipyate naraha i am sure many of you would have reflected on karma yoga covered in detail during our last session the topic for today's lecture is jnana karma sanyasa yoga the chapter 4 of bhagavad gita the knowledge of renunciation in action let me share with you an interesting story of an archery champion after winning several archery contests the young and rather boastful champion challenged a sage who was also renowned for his skill as an archer the young man demonstrated remarkable technical proficiency when he hit a distant bull's eye on his first try and then split that same arrow with his second shot there he said arrogantly to the old master see if you can match that undisturbed the master did not draw his bow but rather motion for the young man to follow him up the nearby mountain curious about the old man's intentions the champion followed him high into the mountain until they reached a deep chasm bridged by a rather flimsy and shaky log calmly stepping out onto the middle of the unsteady and dangerous bridge connecting the two cliffs the old master drew his bow picked a far away tree as a target and fired a direct clear hit now it is your turn he said as he gradually stepped back onto the safe ground standing on the shaky and flimsy bridge and staring with terror at the seemingly bottomless abyss the young archer could not force himself to step on to the log no less shoot a target he was overcome with fear of heights you have much skill with the bow said the old master sensing his challenge's predicament but you have little skill in control of your mind that lets lose the shot you have little skill in shaping the attitude that enables any action remarked the master and he concluded saying a skillful action is an action performed with evenness of mind arjuna the great warrior was also in a similar state of that of the archer in the story overcome by a different kind of fear in such a state 
all his archery skills were of no use in performing his duty successfully, winning the war. The need of the hour was evenness of mind, freedom from all kinds of fear, a transformation of Arjuna's being and not doing. To be, to do, to have, to give is the order of life. To be, to do, to have and to give. That's the correct order of life. You can give only what you have. If you don't have, you can't give. You can have only what you do. To do anything with perfection, to do anything right, the focus is not to just get the doing right, but also get the being right. What is most important is the being within. Any positive transformation has to happen at the level of the being. Arjuna was the best of the best in warfare. For him to perform his duty, he needed no additional skills in warfare. He needed guidance to bring about a transformation of his being. And over the last sessions, we have seen how Lord Krishna is enabling Arjuna and all of us embark on this journey of a revitalizing transformation. Let me summarize some of the key learnings, key concepts of Chapter 3, Karma Yoga, using some mathematical equations. Karma, action, plus Kamna. Kamna stands for expectation for results, expectations for personal gain. Kamna. Karma plus Kamna is equal to Kamya Karma. Kamya Karma. This is the way of life for all of us. Desire driven actions. Selfish actions. Karma minus Kamna is equal to Nishkama Karma. Selfless action. Karma minus doership. That is ascribing the doership to the three gunas of Prakriti is equal to Akartritva. Karma minus ego is equal to yajna. And we can take this one step further. Karma minus ego plus dedication of the action as an offering to the Lord is equal to kainkarya. Let us recap the anchor shloka of chapter 3. Mai Sarvani Karmani Sanyasya Dhyatma Chetasa Nirashi Nirmamo Bhutva Yudhyasva Vigata Jwaraha Karma Yoga is Lord's prescription for enlightened, successful living. In this shloka, Lord Sri Krishna gives us five formulae to be applied. Sarvani Karmani Mai Sanyasya Offering all actions to the Lord. Dedicating all actions to the Lord. Sarvani karmani mai sanyasya. Adhyatma chetasa. With a clear mind regarding the nature of the self. Nirasihi. Having no desire for the results. That is with a focus on the action and not on the results. Nirmamaha Bhutva, without egotism, devoid of the feeling of ownership of the action. Vigata Jwaraha, free from the fever of anxiety regarding the outcome. Karma Yoga is putting these five formulae into practice. Mahi Sarvani Karmani, Sanyasya Dhyatma Chetasa, Nirashir, Nirmamo Bhutva. Yudhyasva Vigata Chwaraha. 
Krishna also categorically declared in chapter 3, Yeme matamidam nityam anutishtanti manavaha, shadhavanto nasuyanto muchyante tepi karmabihi. Whoever follows this teaching of mine, Krishna declares, that is practice of karma yoga, with their minds full of faith and free from disparagement, they are released from the bondage of karma. Karma bih uchyante. A great assurance of the Lord. It is quite appropriate at this juncture to do a deep dive on the law of karma and understand what is karma. Understand what is karma bandhana, bondage of karma. Understand samsara. While we all now understand that karma broadly stands for action, we also see its usage in the context of a baggage we carry, the karmic baggage. We also see its usage in the context of punya and papa, merit and sins, in the context of results. Many of you approached me with several questions on this topic and therefore it will be worthwhile to address this topic before we do a deep dive into chapter 4. There is an innate human desire to attain happiness. As the mind and sense organs are extroverted by nature, a person naturally looks outward at the objects of the world in order to gain happiness. The mind seeks happiness and fulfillment in the objects of the world and therefore one wants to acquire, constantly acquire different objects. Actions performed to acquire desirable ends are called Kamya Karma. All our day-to-day -day actions by default tend to be Kamya Karma desire driven actions. What we need to understand is that the results of desire prompted actions are limited. As we examine our own needs, we understand that what we seek is lasting happiness, not just temporary happiness. We need lasting security, not temporary security. Undoubtedly, the world and all the things it offers can give us some happiness and security. However, they can only give the happiness and security that are limited in time, place and measure. While what we seek is lasting happiness and security. Also, the results of desire prompted actions are binding in nature. When I perform an action propelled by a desire, my attention tends to be on the result than on the action. I can have one of two responses towards the result. If the result is branded as success, I respond favorably to it. If the result is branded a failure, I respond unfavorably to it. If the result is favorable, there is attachment or raga. And if the result is unfavorable, there is hatred or dvesha. It's important to understand these two terms, raga, attachment and dvesha, hatred. I find that my relationship to the result and to the various situations I encounter in life is one of attraction or repulsion. Raga, dvesha. Therefore, through the performance of Kamya Karma, not only do I gain results, certain achievements in my life, but I simultaneously also accumulate Raga and Dvesha, attractions and repulsions. These likes and dislikes are the reactions that we call impurities of the mind. These likes and dislikes are the seeds of further desires because there is a natural desire to achieve what I like and avoid what I dislike. Likes and dislikes thus become the cause for further desires, which in turn become the cause for further actions in a perpetual chain of action and reaction. 
Kamya karma has a tendency to perpetuate the chain of action and reaction over many lifetimes, binding us in the cycle of samsara. This is karma bandhana, bondage of karma. Let's understand this concept of binding. Karma bandhana, samsara. For this we need to understand karma vasanas and karma phala. Every action produces a twofold reaction. We know that for every action there is a reaction. But we also need to understand that every reaction is twofold in nature, by nature. A result and a fragrance. Every action produces a twofold reaction. It produces a result, a karma phala. It also produces what is called a karma vasana, fragrance. Every action leaves behind a fragrance. I talked about Raga and Dvesha, likes and dislikes. These are two sides of a coin, but different for everyone. Where do these likes and dislikes come from? Let me illustrate with an example. When I drank a delicious cup of South Indian coffee for the first time, I liked it so much that I wanted to have it again and again every day. While the cup of coffee gave me pleasure, which was an immediate tangible effect, it also had an intangible effect. It left behind a subtle impression in my mind to have the experience again and again. That subtle impression is what is called karma vasana, meaning fragrance of that action in the mind. Since I liked the coffee so much, I went to a shop, bought all the ingredients needed and started making it at home first thing in the morning, every day. I began to enjoy that hot cup of coffee in the morning, every day. Every time I enjoy the coffee, the subtle impression in the mind becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. It comes to a stage that as soon as I get up, I have to have a cup of coffee and without it, I cannot do anything else. My happiness depends on having that cup of coffee, otherwise I feel miserable. Looking at the mechanics of this process reveals that deliberate egocentric actions will leave intangible impressions of likes or dislikes called vasanas in the core of the mind. These vasanas in turn cause desires at the intellectual level, agitations at the mind level and actions at the body level. All egocentric desires are grosser manifestations of the subtler impressions in the mind, the karma vasanas. While when vasanas manifest as desires, they cause agitations in the mind and the mind becomes restless until those desires are fulfilled. When the vasana for, of coffee, the coffee vasana manifests as desire for coffee, my mind is no longer free to think of anything other than that hot cup of coffee that I think I need in order to be happy. I can suppress the desire temporarily, but it will keep springing up again and again in one form or the other. On the other hand, the desires suppressed will express as anger, frustration or irritation. On the other hand, when a desire is fulfilled, my mind becomes calm and quiet and I am happy until of course the next set of vasanas drives me to something else. I'll be tossed from one desire to the other. Life becomes a rat race trying to fulfill one desire after another. 
in the example of the coffee unless i have that hot cup of coffee in the morning i am agitated and restless and cannot do anything else and when the coffee comes i am back to myself and i say that i am so happy that i have my cup of coffee happiness did not really come with the coffee but when the desire for coffee is fulfilled all the agitations of the mind subside and i am back to myself i am free from a wanting mind or a desiring mind in those moments the mind is calm and i say i am happy and i think that the coffee gave me happiness in fact the happiness is actually being tapped from myself because as we discussed before i am in reality complete and full or limitless and that is a state of happiness hence happiness is my intrinsic nature fulfilling the desire for coffee has brought me back to myself and i am content by, with myself at least for those few moments until another desire pops up in my mind so from this example we arrive at some important conclusions karma vasanas are accumulated by deliberate willful actions we can call them egocentric actions or selfish actions if we examine our lives we go from one environment to the other to fulfill our likes and dislikes we are driven by our vasanas to seek environments that are conducive to fulfill our vasanas in the process of fulfillment we only reinforce those vasanas thus we get caught up in this whirlpool of vasanas desires agitations actions vasanas more desires more agitations more actions more vasanas that's the whirlpool of vasanas every egocentric action that we perform will leave its characteristic vasanas in the mind there are vasanas that cannot be exhausted in this life and they are stored into our total account chitta part of our mind is the memory bank where these countless subtle impressions are stored the size of this memory bank depends on the accumulated number of karma vasanas when we talk about karmic baggage we are actually referring to this memory bank filled with karma vasanas the total amount of vasanas that each person has is called sanchita karma of the total account we can only bring into this life those that can be exhausted or those that are ready to germinate the ones we bring into this life with us are called prarabdha karma and one can loosely translate it as our destiny of our current life in a way therefore what we call destiny is also result of consequences of actions done during past lifetimes we always seek an environment that is conducive for the fulfillment of our vasanas thus we seek birth in a particular place and to particular parents so that we may exhaust the set of vasanas that are ready to germinate the type of physical body the surroundings the environment into which we are born are all determined by our prarabdha karma in the course of living and being a willful person we act we continue to perform actions that are selfish egocentric in nature and in the process of acting we keep accumulating new set of vasanas that can in turn either be exhausted in this life or put back into our total account this new set of vasanas that are being deposited into our account as we keep acting or called agami karma thus we have sanchita karma total account and from which we bring only those that can be exhausted in in the current life prarabdha karma and the new ones that are being freshly accumulated and deposited into our account called agami karma now that we understand karma vasanas let us examine karma phala the other component of a reaction of for every action every action produces a result which is what is called karma phala no action goes without a phala however the result can be immediately visible drishta phalam leading to sukha or dukha 
that is experiencing happiness or experiencing sorrow or adrishtapalam invisible result leading to punya papa merit and sin a merit accumulated is just nothing but a delayed experience of happiness and a sin accumulated is similarly a delayed experience of unhappiness how long does it take for today's adrishtapala to be converted into adrishtapala the duration is not fixed and it varies from karma to karma like the different lead times of fructification of different seeds thus when a person dies there are many unfructified punya papa merit and sins which remain potential in the sukshma sharira karana sharira the causal subtle body every jivatma individual soul has a causal body that determines the nature of its next physical body nature of its embodiment at the time of new birth that is when the soul takes up its association with a new physical embodiment the soul takes with it not only all the karma palas or accumulated fruits of its past actions that are yet to be experienced but also its all its karma vasanas all its latent desires impulsions propensities to do particular actions our karma phalas are like the edible part of a fruit while our karma vasanas are like the seeds contained in that fruit the causal body the sukshma sharira the karana sharira comprising of the vasanas and karma phala the karmic baggage that a soul carries is the cause in determining what type of physical body what type of parents what type of environment what type of world that one needs in order to exhaust one's vasanas in this model every cause and effect is perfectly accounted for no one gets anything to which he is not entitled and god runs the perfect computer that takes care of this accounting system totally error free there is nothing called luck or bad luck good luck or bad luck everyone gets what he deserves whether one wins millions in a lottery or loses them when the stock market crashes in the chronology of an action vasana comes first followed by thoughts then desires and finally actions vasanas when not manifest remain dormant in us Uh, as our potential nature vasanas are unmanifest thoughts thoughts are unmanifest desires desires are unmanifest actions since action is symbol of our life we are a substantial form of our insubstantial vasanas how do we escape the clutches of samsara escape the clutches of this karmic bondage karma bandhana how do we eradicate karma vasanas vasana lessness to thoughtlessness to desirelessness to actionlessness is the right process but it is important to understand that actionlessness is not abstinence from action the only way to eradicate vasanas is to have right knowledge study and practice of our scriptures thereby we discipline our vasanas thoughts and desires thereby perform right selfless actions which lead to chitta shuddhi that is eradication of our vasanas formatting the memory bank where these vasanas are stored to sum up a mature aspirant seeks to avoid kamya karma or selfish desire prompted action because he knows that the result of selfish action is limited and the result is binding and not a liberating result it is important to understand that we are not slaves to the cycle of karma we can be liberated from the clutches of the bondage by taking charge of our future by right actions and right knowledge our present situation is due to your past 
and hence our future situation will be governed by our present actions based on our free will granted by the Lord. Therefore the solution is Karma Yoga, performing right actions with the right attitude. When an action is selfless, there is no accumulation of Karma Vasana. When the result of the action is dedicated to God, there is no accumulation of Karma Phala. When an action is selfless, there is no accumulation of Karma Vasana. And when the result of the action is dedicated to God, there is no accumulation of Karma Phala. With this understanding of Karma Yoga, now let us move along. Sri Krishna opens chapter 4 by announcing that the doctrine of Karma Yoga is a very ancient one. He declares that he himself has instructed this doctrine to Vivaswan, the sun god, at the commencement of the world and that Vivaswan imparted the teaching to Manu and Manu in turn passed it on to Ikshvaku. This treasure of wisdom was preserved in an unbroken tradition by the great sages of the past but it faded away during later times owing to great lapse of time. Lord Krishna then says, as you are my friend and devotee Arjuna, I am giving you this ancient wisdom. Krishna reinforces the authoritativeness of Karma Yoga by highlighting the fact that this philosophy of conduct promulgated to the most ancient sages and preserved by them as a priceless treasure is now being revealed again in order to bring Arjuna back to a path that is right and righteous. However, Arjuna is baffled, puzzled, possibly like most of us. Being his contemporary, how could Sri Krishna have taught this discipline of Karma Yoga to his primeval seers going back in time thousands of years? This prompts Krishna to share his avatar rahasya, the secret doctrine of divine incarnation. It is important to know that God's avatara's incarnations are not myths. They are historical facts. By calling our rich ancient history, by calling our Puranas and Itihasas, mythology, modern day Indologists are doing a big disservice to Sanatana Dharma. The plurality of his previous incarnations is mentioned by Krishna as a historical fact, not less real than the transmigration of individual souls, with a one point of major difference. Krishna, the Supreme Being, is aware of all his incarnations through his uninterrupted omniscience. In, his, in assuming birth, God does not abrogate his intrinsic nature of being the birthless and deathless supreme ruler of all existence. His fundamental infinitude of perfection undergoes no diminution in the process of incarnation. This is clearly brought out in Bhagavad Ramanuja's address to the Lord in his Sharanagadi Gadhyay, one of his masterpieces. Akilaheya Pratyanika Kalyanaikatana Svetara Samastavastu Vilakshana Ananta Jnana Anandheka Swarupa. Akilaheya Pratyanika, totally blemishless, opposed to all flaws. The Lord is Kalyanaikatana, full of auspicious qualities, infinite divine attributes. Svetara Samastavastu Vilakshana, different and distinct from all sentient and insentient. Unique, nothing which is comparable to the Lord. He is Ananta Jnana Nandeka Swarupa. His, his nature is that of infinite knowledge and bliss. He is infinite knowledge and bliss personified. He is Ananta, omnipresent, beyond the realm of space and time. Divine incarnation is not due to the force of karma but is due to the spontaneity of divine will. Krishna declares, Yada yada hi dharmasya glhanir bhavati bharata abhyudhanam dharmasya tadatmanam sujamyaham Wherever there is a decline of dharma, 
an ascendance of adharma then hey arjuna i manifest i incarnate in a divine body the lord's divine body is aprakrita non material is not subject to mutation like matter it is not made of the five elements it's not made of the pancha bhutas it's important to understand this fact paritranaay sadhunam vinashaya chatushkritam dharma samstapanarthay sambhavami yuge yuge krishna says for the protection of the good for the destruction of the wicked and for the establishment of dharma i am born from age to age the time for divine descent is a time of moral crisis in the world when righteousness tends to wane and unrighteousness is in at ascendancy the purpose of divine incarnation is the moral regeneration of the world this reestablishment of dharma is accomplished in two ways those who are devoted to god are protected sustained and nourished and those who are evil and antagonistic to the call of the divine are destroyed destruction killing of the evil has to be clearly understood the evil are released from their present condition so that in a new embodiment they too may eventually turn godward they too may eventually turn godward incarnation is the descent of god from the ascent for the ascent of man incarnation is the descent of god for the ascent of man krishna goes on to say that the correct understanding of the nature of divine incarnation yields spiritual results of immense value janma karma cha me divyam evam yoveti tatpatah tyaktva deham punarjanma naiti mameti sorjuna hey arjuna my avatar my incarnation is extraordinary my embodiment is aprakrita that is it is divine and unique and not made of matter my sportive de- my sportive deeds are capable of eradicating all sins at the mere recollection of the acts he who actually knows this truth regarding my incarnation and leelas does not get reborn and he attains me says bhagavan krishna na karanat karanadva karana karanan cha sharira grahanam vaapi dharmatranaya kevalam in sri vishnu purana brahma speaks of the glory of bhagavan sri man narayana's avataras brahma says your human like divine body is neither due to punya karma that is merit which bestows comforts during a lifetime nor is it due to papa karma sin which causes sorrow that is as is the case with human beings hey bhagavan your body is not intended for experiencing sorrow which is the fruit of papa karma nor is it meant for experiencing comforts being the fruit of punya karma your body is not constituted by prakriti or its evolutes it is divine na karanat karanadva karana karanana cha sharira grahanam vaapi dharmatranaay kevalam brahmas address to sri mahavishnu in vishnu purana sri shuka also stated that bhagavan sri man narayana descends in human form not merely to destroy the evil doers but also to teach the mankind how to lead a good life demonstrate right way of living through an exemplary example the term karma in this shloka janma karma cha me divyam does not refer to punya karma or papa karma it only means bhagavan's sportive deeds he who comprehends the truth concerning divine incarnation is cleansed of all taints that obstruct the development of devotion to god and in the same life in which this comprehension arises he attains god 
God's perpetual divine incarnations to establish dharma, to protect and sustain his creation also demonstrates karma yoga in action. God's actions are not binding. They are completely selfless. Actions do not affect me, nor have I any desire for the fruits of action, declares Krishna. It is important to know that while Krishna is the author of all creation, he is not responsible for the inequalities found in his creation. Neither the charge of cruelty nor that of partiality can be legitimately leveled at the creator. When we plant a seed in the ground, it sprouts and grows into a plant. The seed sprouted only because of earth, water and sunlight. The seed cannot spring into life without these. But only a mango tree will grow from a mango seed. A jackfruit tree will not. When different types of seeds are sown, different trees grow. Earth or water is not the agent of these differences. Similarly, Bhagavan is the agent of creation but it is the individual karmas like the seeds that are responsible for the differences in the created world. Therefore, constant contemplation on the nature of God's work, how he acts constantly without any selfish motive, without attachment to the action performed and without any attachment to the results, prepares one for the journey of karma yoga. From time immemorial, Krishna says, the seekers of liberation have thus practiced karma yoga. But Krishna cautions, karma yoga is not easy to comprehend. Kim karma kim, kim akarmeti kavayo piyatra mohitaha tatte karma pravakshyami yajnatva mokshyase subhat. Kim karma kima karmeti kavayo yatra mohitaha tatte karma pravakshyami yajnatva mokshase subhat yat nyatva yat nyatva by knowing and practicing which mokshase subhat mokshase asubhat freed from the bondage of transmigration. Kim karma, what are the kind of actions to be performed by one seeking liberation? Kim akarma, what is that which is different from action? Here akarma is the knowledge inherent in every action but which is different from the physical act itself. Even enlightened persons are confused with regard to karma and akarma. Therefore, Sri Krishna says that he will explain them and by understanding and following the teaching, Arjuna will be able to transcend the clutches of samsara. What is the difficulty in understanding the essence of Karma Yoga? Why do people get confused? Krishna continues. Karmano hyapi bodhavyam bodhavyam cha vikarmanaha akarmanas cha bodhavyam gahana karmano gatihi Karmano hyapi bodhavyam bodhavyam cha vikarmanaha akarmanas cha bodhavyam gahana karmano gatihi gahana is hard to acquire karmana gatihi insight into the way of action there is something extremely subtle to be understood in relation to karma vikarma and also in relation to akarma the path of action to be followed by one seeking liberation is indeed unfathomable, says Krishna. We need to make note of a key point at this juncture. In the earlier verse in Shloka 16, Krishna starts off saying, Kim karma, kim akarma. Referring to karma and akarma. And then in the second line, he concludes, Tatte karma pravakshyami by referring to both karma and akarma with one term karma. Therefore, Krishna clearly indicates that he is not talking about two different things. Karma and akarma are not opposites. This has to be very clearly understood. If karma is action, akarma is not the opposite of action. Akarma is not inaction. Also, Krishna concludes 
ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಸೆವೆಂಟೀನ್ ಡಿಕ್ಲೇರಿಂಗ್ ಗಹನ ಕರ್ಮಣೋಗತಿ ಆಫ್ಟರ್ ರೆಫರಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕರ್ಮ ಅಕರ್ಮ ವಿಕರ್ಮ ಕರ್ಮಣೋಹ್ಯ ಬೋಧವ್ಯ ಬೋಧವ್ಯ ವಿಕರ್ಮಣ ಅಕರ್ಮಣಶ್ಚ ಬೋಧವ್ಯ ಗಹನ ಕರ್ಮಣೋಗತಿ clearly using the term karma to broadly refer to all the three terms karma akarma and vikarma thereby indicating that these three terms are many aspects of karma and are not to be understood as opposites vikarma has to be therefore understood as vividha karma signifying manifold actions that a man engages in the course of his life and akarma should not be taken as signifying negation of activity or absence of action here akarma in this context is the knowledge inherent in every action but which is different from the physical act itself almost immediately after mentioning the combination of karma and akarma the text drops the negative term akarma and substitutes gnana in its place in shloka 19 ಎಸ್ಯ ಸರ್ವೆ ಸಮಾರಂಭ ಕಾಮ ಸಂಕಲ್ಪ ವರ್ಜಿತ ಜ್ಞಾನಾಗ್ನಿದಕ್ತ ಕರ್ಮಾಂ ತಮಾಹು ಪಂಡಿತ ಬುಧ ಸೊ ದ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ಡ್ರಾಪ್ಸ್ ದ ನೆಗೆಟಿವ್ ಟರ್ಮ್ ಅಕರ್ಮ ಅಂಡ್ ಸಬ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ಇನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಪ್ಲೇಸ್ ದೇರ್ ಫೋರ್ ಅಕರ್ಮ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕಾಂಟೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಕ್ಲಿಯರ್ಲಿ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟುಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಜ್ಞಾನ ನಾಲೆಜ್ ಇನ್ಹೆರೆಂಟ್ ಇನ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಆಕ್ಷನ್ ನೋ ಲೆಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಡ್ವೆಲ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಇಂಪೋರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಏಟೀನ್ ಒನ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಆಂಕರ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ಮಯೋಗ ಕರ್ಮಣ್ಯ ಕರ್ಮಯ ಪಶ್ಯೇತ್ ಅಕರ್ಮಣಿ ಚ ಕರ್ಮಯ ಸಬುದ್ಧಿಮಾನ್ ಮನುಷ್ಯೇಶು ಸ ಯುಕ್ತ ಕೃತ್ಸ್ನ ಕರ್ಮ ಕೃತ್ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಶ್ಲೋಕ ಟು ಮೆಡಿಟೇಟ್ ಆನ್ ಕರ್ಮಣ್ಯ ಕರ್ಮಯ ಪಶ್ಯೇತ್ ಅಕರ್ಮಣಿ ಚ ಕರ್ಮಯ ಸಬುದ್ಧಿಮಾನ್ ಮನುಷ್ಯೇಶು ಸ ಯುಕ್ತ ಕೃತ್ಸ್ನ ಕರ್ಮ ಕೃತ್ ಹೀ ಹು ಸೀಕ್ಸ್ ಅಕರ್ಮ akarma is knowledge of the self he who sees akarma in action and action karma in akarma he who sees akarma in karma and karma in akarma that is he who sees knowledge in action and action in knowledge krishna says only he is wise and only he is fit for liberation karmani akarmaya pashyet he who sees akarma in karma knowledge in action akarmani cha karmaya he who sees action in knowledge while a man is engaged in action he must bear within himself a clear understanding of the real nature of the soul if that awareness of the nature of the soul is kept up in and through action the action becomes a form or embodiment of knowledge itself if that awareness becomes an integral factor in action then that knowledge is nothing but a form or aspect of action itself in short this is a process of spiritualizing action and of concretizing knowledge knowledge and action can be each looked upon as the substance of which the other is the form this intimate fusion of the two is what is propounded in the significant verse that teaches the secret of right action while performing an action how can one see knowledge that knowledge which is distinct from and different to the physical part of the action this is a question also how can one see action in knowledge it is important to understand that karma yoga is performance of an action guided by the knowledge of the self karma yoga is performance of an action guided by atma gnana knowledge of the self when we realize that action performed is physical manifestation of knowledge of the self knowledge of the soul 
then we can see the action as a form of that knowledge. See knowledge in action. Karmani akarmaya pasyet. Let me repeat. When we realize that action performed is physical manifestation of this Atma Jnana, knowledge of the Jivatma, knowledge of the Self, then we see the action as a form of that knowledge. And therefore we can see knowledge in action. Karmani Akarmaya Pasyet. And because this knowledge of the soul is an integral part of the action, and this knowledge forms the attitude that drives the action, we can also see knowledge as a form of action. Akarmanicha karmayaha. See action in knowledge. When can an action, when can a karma become karma yoga? When can what is obviously a normal action be considered a form of knowledge, a form of Atma Jnana? If a man's actions are free from the desire for fruits and if he is free from the delusion that he is the material frame, the human body with which he happens to be associated, then the wise describe that enlightened man as one whose fire of knowledge has destroyed the binding effects of all his past deeds. His action is a faithful manifestation of his knowledge. Yasya Sarve Samarambaha Kama Sankalpa Varjitaha Jnana Agni Dhagda Karmanam Tamahuhu Panditam Pudaha Krishna declares Yasya Sarve Samarambaha Kama Sankalpa Varjitaha Jnana Agni Dhagda Karmanam Tamahuhu Panditam Pudaha who is a learned person? Who is a Pandita? Yasya Sarve Samarambaha Kama Sankalpa Vajjitaha One who performs all actions, all karma without any selfish desire for the fruits. Kama Vajjitaha And any delusive identification of the body with the self. Sankalpa Vajjitaha Kama Vajjitaha Sankalpa Vajjitaha Performing actions without any selfish desire for the fruits. Performing actions without any delusive identification of the body with the self. He only has his accumulated karma burnt up in the fire of knowledge. Jnana Agni Dhagda Karma Anam Tamahuhu Panditam Budaha So far the idea of karma as a form of jnana, as a form of knowledge has been explained as due to the essential fact that the right type of action should contain at its core an awareness of the real nature of the individual soul as transcending the physical body in which it is embodied. Now when a man who being well established in true wisdom looks upon all work as worship and lives the life of active duty, his very way of living becomes a prayer to the Lord. He necessarily becomes free from the bondage of karma. Brahmarpanam Brahmahavir Brahmagnau Brahmanahutam Brahmaiva Tena Gantavyam Brahma Karma Samadhina Krishna says Brahmarpanam Brahmahavir Brahmagnau Brahmanahutam Brahmaiva Tena Gantavyam Brahma Karma Samadhina Brahman is a scriptural term for Ishwara, for Lord, for Bhagavan. To understand this shloka well, we have to bear in mind certain details regarding fire sacrifices, which in fact represent the most prevalent form of Vedic worship. The instruments of the fire sacrifice, Yaga, are Brahman. Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavir, Brahmarpanam, as they are products of Brahman. The offering the material offered in oblation is itself Brahman, Brahma Havihi. The fire into which the oblation is made is Brahman, Brahma Agni. The performer of the sacrifice is also Brahman, Brahmana Hutam. Being the effects of Brahman and the bodies of Brahman, all these are referred to as Brahman, Ishwara. 
he who develops and maintains within himself this settled understanding that as the entire sacrifice or for that matter any duty performed as the Lord Brahman as its ultimate object his soul being sustained by Brahman itself his soul being sustained by Brahman is itself of the nature of Brahman will attain Brahman thus the action performed the duty carried out by the aspirant being permeated by the thought that all the factors and forces involved in action are embodiments of the Lord, embodiments of Brahman. Such an action is indeed a form, an expression of that noble thought itself. Thus, perfect Karma Yoga is a form of Jnana, form of knowledge in two ways. It carries within itself a clear understanding of the nature of the soul, the individual self. And it is permeated by the thought that Brahman, Ishwara, pervades and sustains the entire world of action. Having elaborated the manner in which knowledge is contained within action, Sri Krishna now speaks of different kinds of Karma Yoga various branches of Karma Yoga. Some people sim simply worship the gods. Some others take up the regular modes of the Vedic sacrifice through fire, Yajna. Still others are engaged in the sacrifice of the form of sense control and they try to end the fascination of the senses for their respective objects. Others light the fire of mind control and sacrifice in it all the sense activities that is they try to end the mind's fascination for all these activities krishna continues dravya yajna stapo yajna yoga yajna statha pare swadhyaya jnana yajna scha yataya samsitam prataha dravya yajna sacrifices centered around material factors gathering material resources in a proper way and utilizing them for worship of the gods. Dravya Yajna also stands for charity. Tapo Yajna, engaging in rigorous penances. Yoga Yajna, Yoga Samyoga Praptihi. In other words, reaching, attaining holy places. Tirtha Praptihi, pilgrimages to sacred places. This interpretation of the term yoga is necessitated by the context which is concerned with the classification of types of karma yoga. Swadhyaya yajna, pursuit of the study of scriptures. Jnana yajna, engaging in the cultivation of the import of the scriptures. Dravya yajna, stapo yajna, yoga yajna, stata pare, swadhyaya jnana yajna, scha, yataya samsita vrataha. All these put forth active effort with a firm resolve. There are others who practice systematic breath regulations called pranayama, living on regulated food. Their sacrifice is called pranayama yajna. Thus many types of yajna from dravya yajna, sacrifice of material to pranayama, control of breath, all various branches of karma yoga have been laid down by Sri Krishna. To understand these principles, and then to live according to them leads one to spiritual emancipation. Krishna has now clearly shown that the activity of a perfect practitioner of Karma Yoga is itself a form or expression of Jnana, of knowledge. Now Krishna affirms that in the life of right actions, practice of Karma Yoga, the element of jnana, the element of knowledge, that is the spiritual understanding, forming a factor in the attitude of the performer of duties, is the most important and substantial factor in comparison to the element of external physical exertion by way of work. There was this disciple who approached his master in a monastery and asked him, Master, what were you doing before enlightenment? The master matter-of-fact answered, 
Every day I was felling trees, chopping wood and fetching water from the well. The curious disciple then inquired, Master, what do you do after enlightenment? The master matter of fact answered, I chop wood and fetch water from the well. Looking at the confused demon of the disciple, the master remarked, Enlightenment is not about doing different actions. It is about doing the same actions differently. It is about the quantum shift in the quality of the actions and the attitude behind the actions. For any work done, for any duty performed, for any activity, there are two components. The knowledge component, jnana, that shapes the attitude and the, action, the physical work component, the karma. In the action bearing two aspects of jnana and karma, inner knowledge responsible for the attitude and outer work, the inner aspect of jnana is higher. In the action, in the action bearing two aspects of jnana and karma, inner knowledge responsible for the attitude and outer work, the inner aspect of jnana is superior. It is the right attitude behind every action that determines one's spiritual altitude. Let me repeat. It is the right attitude behind every action that determines one's spiritual altitude. As we keep practicing Karma Yoga, selfless contributory duty aligned with a higher cause, driven by the knowledge of one's true nature, the sins get destroyed more and more. Not only no new accumulation of Karma Vasanas, not only no new accumulation of Karma Phalas, even the baggage, the accumulated Karmas gets destroyed. Knowledge expands more and more. There is no more clouding of the intellect by the karma vasanas. There is a state of crystal clear clarity of the mind. Knowledge blossoms to the state of direct vision of the soul. Atma Sakshatkara. Now Krishna gives a profound advice to Arjuna and to all of us. Tat vidhi pranipatena pariprasnena sevaya upadekshyantite jnanam jnaninas tatpadarshinaha. With reverential salutations, you must approach the wise men who have known the truth. Serve them and question them repeatedly with due respect until your doubts are clarified. These wise men will impart the knowledge of this divine truth to you, says Krishna. This shloka clearly highlights the importance of a guru in one's spiritual progress. And finally, Sri Krishna concludes, Tasmat Agnana Sambhutam Hrishtam Jnana Sinatmanaha Chitvainam Samshayam Yogam Take hold of Arjuna, Uttishta. Arise for battle, hey Arjuna, says Krishna. Krishna concludes the chapter with these profound words. Arjuna Cut asunder your doubts concerning the nature of your soul, concerning the self. Doubts that have been engendered by the beginningless primordial ignorance through the sword of knowledge. Knowledge about the soul. Knowledge of your true nature imparted by me and take to the way of action that I am inculcating. For that purpose, stand up and Get ready for action. 
get up to fight in the war hey arjuna born in the bharata lineage to you fighting in the battle in the righteous manner is karma yoga says bhagavan shri ranga mangala nidhim karuna anivasam shri venkatadri shikarale kalameham shri asti shaila shikarojjhal parijatam shri sannamami sirasa yadushaila deepam om tat sat sarvam shri krishna arpanamastu